Along the riverbanks of South America during the late Pliocene to early Pleistocene, roughly three to two million years ago, a bizarre creature ruled the wetlands. It wasn't a mammoth or a dinosaur, but Joseph Artigasia Manessi, a rodent the size of a bison. What makes this fascinating is that everything we know about this species comes from a single fossilized skull. The real question is how one bone can completely reshape our understanding of rodent evolution. The discovery of Joseph Artigasia was a surprising journey. It all began when a nearly complete fossilized skull was found on Key Beach in the San Jose region of Uruguay. However, instead of being studied immediately, the specimen sat unrecognized in a collection for many years. It wasn't until 2008 that two researchers, Andres Rinderknecht and R. Ernesto Blanco, formally described the fossil in the journal Proceedings of the Royal Society B. They named it Josefo Artigasia Monesi, and only then did the paleontological community realize they had found evidence of the largest rodent that ever existed on Earth. From a forgotten specimen, this skull became the key to unveiling the existence of a colossal creature challenging our previous understanding of rodent evolution. The argument over just how large Joseph Artigasia really was quickly centered on one issue, which part of the skull you measure when the rest of the skeleton is missing. Different cranial and skeletal proxies can generate strikingly different outcomes, especially when applied to an animal far outside the known size range of its relatives. When the fossil was first described in 2008, Andres Rinderknecht and Ernesto Blanco used cranial dimensions such as overall skull length and jaw depth to make their estimates. Their scaling produced an average of about 1,211 kilograms with values spanning from 468 kilograms at the low end to a maximum of 2,586 kilograms. The midpoint suggested a rodent weighing more than a ton making it heavier than a typical bison and placing it far above other extinct giants like Phoberomys. That figure caught wide attention because it implied a rodent not simply larger than capybaras, but potentially the size of a small car. Yet almost immediately, other researchers highlighted the weaknesses of this approach. Virginie Millian pointed out that the study's data set was limited and included measurements from populations within the same species which could inflate correlations. She reanalyzed the fossil in 2008 using a broader set of 35 rodent species and found lower values averaging around 903 kilograms with a range between 272 and 1535 kilograms. This still painted Joseph Artigasia as enormous but shifted its place from car-like extremes down toward more plausible megafaunal territory, somewhere between the heft of a large steer and that of a mid-sized rhinoceros. Millian also stressed that skull length was an unreliable variable. For this animal, Joseph Artigasia's skull appeared about 45% longer than expected relative to its teeth, a proportion that could have overstated its body mass. The debate gained new clarity in 2022 when paleontologist Russell Engelman tested another metric altogether, the width of the occipital condyles. These are the rounded joints where the skull meets the first neck vertebra and they scale closely with the weight the neck must support. Because condyle width reflects the actual structural load of the head, it tends to give more conservative and reliable predictions than stretched skull length ratios in animals that deviate from normal proportions. By applying this method, Engelman arrived at a range of roughly 254 to 576 kilograms, with the most likely values clustering between 480 and 500 kilograms. This estimate reduced Joseph Artigasia from a car-sized giant to something closer to the mass of a large cow. That does not make it ordinary. At 500 kilograms, it still outweighed grizzly bears matched or exceeded bison and utterly dwarfed today's 60 kilogram capybaras. But it suggested that early headlines had exaggerated the case by relying on scaling equations stretched beyond their safe limits. Why do the numbers diverge so sharply? 
because each cranial proxy captures different evolutionary pressures. Skull length may be distorted by adaptations like enlarged incisors. Jaw depth and molar width relate more to feeding mechanics than to body mass itself. Occipital condyles, by contrast, tell you how much weight the neck was structurally built to carry. Each perspective produces a different portrait, and when seen together, they demonstrate the uncertainty inherent in reconstructing the size of an animal, so unlike anything alive today. The weight debate narrowed Joseph O. Artigasia's likely dimensions, but it also raised deeper questions about the nature of the skull itself. Beyond simple size, its design carried features that looked unusually reinforced. Its elongated incisors reached 30 centimeters, and its bones appeared able to tolerate stresses well above those required by chewing alone. This leads to the next puzzle. If Joseph O. Artigasia wasn't merely built for grinding vegetation with molars, then what exactly were those massive front teeth for? Its most striking feature was not its size, but the towering incisors jutting from its jaw. Each measured nearly 30 centimeters long, about the length of a school ruler, and projected forward like chisels, while rodents typically rely on continuously growing incisors for gnawing wood or vegetation. Here the proportions were so extreme that paleontologists doubted ordinary feeding could explain them. With molars small relative to body size, Joseph Artigasia didn't seem designed for hours of grinding abrasive grasses, which we know from isotopic evidence were not its primary diet. Instead, signs point toward the consumption of C3 plants, forest leaves, fruits and aquatic vegetation foods that wouldn't demand colossal molars, suggesting those outsized incisors had roles extending well beyond chewing. That suspicion gained traction once researchers attempted to quantify its bite force. Early reconstructions based on estimated jaw musculature suggested bites between roughly 800 and 1,200 newtons in strength with a mean near 959N. By comparison, that is several times stronger than most modern rodents enough to puncture wood or tough plant matter. But later work using CT scanning and finite element analysis, FEA, expanded the picture. These engineering models digitally reconstructed the skull and tested how it would distribute stress under different bite scenarios. Results showed huge ranges between about 967 and 1850 N at the incisors, rising as high as 2900 to 5500 N at the rear molars. Numbers at the upper end overlap with large carnivores. Tigers, for instance, deliver about 4500 N at their canines, while large crocodiles surpass 5,000 N. For a herbivorous rodent, this put Joseph Wartagasia far outside ordinary expectations. The crucial twist was what the simulations revealed about structural strength. Even under peak pressures, stresses across the skull and incisors fell well below the bone's breaking threshold. This is what scientists mean when they call it over-engineered. FEA predicted that the skull and teeth could resist forces far beyond what chewing soft plants would require. That overcapacity hints at functions better explained by mechanical stress levering soil, working through dense vegetation or warding off attackers. In other words, the incisors were not merely overgrown chisels for eating, they were multi-purpose tools. The closest modern analogue may be an elephant. Elephant tusks are also elongated incisors used not for mastication, but for stripping bark, pushing obstacles, testing rivals, or digging waterholes. Joseph Wartagasia's anatomy obeyed a similar principle, though adapted into rodent form. Its tusk-like teeth may have let it excavate roots, snap woody stems, or cut pathways through dense wetlands. And with predators like terror birds, and saber-toothed cats roaming Pleistocene South America, their potential as weapons cannot be ignored. In desperate encounters, a thrust from 30 centimeter incisors backed by a half-ton body and near carnivore level bite force could have presented a serious deterrent. This blend of features places Joseph Wartagasia in a unique niche. It was not grazing monotonously like a bison or cropping reeds like a capybara, but tapping into resources other rodents could not. Its massive incisors may also have served in social interactions, possibly displaying maturity or dominance in the way tusks do in elephants today. The anatomy shows us a rodent that blurred categories part specialist feeder, part digger, part defender. Even within the already diverse group of South American caviar morph rodents, Joseph Wartagasia seems to have stretched the design to its limits. 
The incisors then were not an eccentric flourish, but the key to its success. They provided tools to access buried food, fend off competition, and survive in dynamic environments along rivers and deltas. They also signal that the species adaptations extended beyond feeding mechanics into locomotion behavior and even sensory biology. To understand how this giant rodent actually functioned day to day, we need to turn from its jaws to its head as a whole where its brain senses and skull features offer an equally surprising part of the story. Could an animal this massive also carry a brain that matched its needs rather than lagged behind its bulk. That has been a recurring question for paleontologists examining Joseph Oartigasia. Oversized species are often assumed to be slow dim or poorly equipped, but new anatomical evidence offers a different picture. In 2024, a team used a digital endocast of its cranial cavity to reconstruct the size and organization of the brain. Their analysis introduced the phylogenetic encephalization quotient for caviomorphs, a method that accounts for shared ancestry rather than relying on simple brain-to-body ratios. The results showed that Joseph Oartigasia fell comfortably within the encephalization range of its living relatives, such as capybaras and agoutis. In other words, even though it was hundreds of times larger, its relative brain investment was comparable overturning earlier assumptions that giant rodents must have proportionally tiny inefficient brains. The Endocast also highlighted specific features linked to sensory performance. One of the most noticeable was an elongated olfactory tract, suggesting that smell was heightened and possibly crucial in its daily life. In estuarine forests and wetlands, where wind shifts, water muddies, vision and scent carries across vegetation, such a trait would have been vital for detecting edible plants, identifying companions or recognizing predators. A second key observation was the development of a pronounced sagittal sinus along the skull roof. This vascular channel is thought to have assisted with blood circulation and temperature regulation in a head of such scale, perhaps protecting brain tissue during exertion or heat stress. Hints of auditory specialization also appear in the cranium, though evidence here is less conclusive. Certain structures suggest Joseph Oartigasia may have been sensitive to low frequency sounds, a useful advantage in dense habitats, but the data invite caution rather than certainty. Placed into its Pleistocene early Pleistocene environment, these neuroanatomical features seem practical rather than extravagant. The San Jose Rigon formation of Uruguay preserves what was then a patchwork of forested floodplains, delta margins, and estuarine waterways. Layers of silt, stone, and clay suggest shifting water levels, while plant material points to lush C3 vegetation, soft leaves, aquatic plants, and forest fruits that dominated its diet. The fauna sharing this setting was equally striking. Toxodontids grazing the lowlands, giant ground sloths stripping trees, glyptodonts armored against attack, saber-toothed cats prowling in ambush, and terror birds patrolling the open ground. For a half-ton rodent navigating such a stage, senses capable of picking up smells, faint vibrations, or sudden noises carried as much weight as its defensive teeth and size. Dietary studies align neatly with this ecological picture. Isotopic evidence shows a preference for plants that thrived in shaded wetter regions rather than dry grasslands, consistent with leaves, aquatic vegetation, and soft fruits. Such choices place Joseph Oartigasia into direct competition with a range of herbivores, each targeting different heights and textures of foliage. To persist in that competition without the benefits of great speed, it relied on its structural defenses plus an awareness of its surroundings. A sudden scent of predator musk, a rustling vibration in the reeds or the calls of its own kind may have been cues it processed with the help of neural investments revealed by its brain cavity. Taken together, these traits show that Joseph Oartigasia was not a clumsy experiment in size, but a rodent well adapted to its home range. Its brain structure matched that of relatives scaled up with a strong olfactory sense, vascular adaptations, and likely competent, though not extreme, auditory processing. Combined with its tusk, like incisors and heavy body, these traits argue for an animal fully integrated into the wetlands and forests of prehistoric Uruguay. Understanding this balance of uh, anatomy and environment leads naturally to a broader reflection. One skull can tell us about brain senses, diet and competition, but it also highlights how much remains uncertain about Joseph Artigasia's life 
and eventual disappearance. The extinction of Joseph Wartagaisia remains a puzzle for scientists with two main theories currently under debate. The first theory points to climate and habitat change. During the late Pliocene and early Pleistocene, the Earth experienced significant shifts in climate transitioning from humid tropical regions to drier, cooler environments. Joseph Oatagasia was dependent on these moist forests and wetlands, which provided an abundant food source of aquatic plants and soft leaves. As the climate changed, these forests may have shrunk or disappeared, severely reducing their food supply. A massive creature like Joseph Wartagesia required a huge amount of food daily, so any change in its environment would have been catastrophic. It was simply too large to adapt quickly or move easily to a new habitat, leaving it vulnerable to the forces of nature. Of The second theory suggests competition and predation. Although Joseph Wartagesia had a massive size and formidable incisors for defense, it still faced a host of terrifying predators from its era, including saber-toothed cats, Smilodon, and giant flightless terror birds, Forus Ratsidae. While its size may have been a defensive advantage for apex predators, such a large prey animal was an abundant source of nourishment. Furthermore, it had to compete with other large herbivores for increasingly scarce food resources. This competition could have put Joseph Oatagasia at a disadvantage, causing it to gradually weaken and eventually go extinct. To this day, both theories have their own supporting arguments. Many scientists believe that the extinction of Joseph Oatagasia may have been the result of a combination of both factors, a rapidly changing habitat, weaken the species, while the pressure from predators and competition for food delivered the final blow, pushing this giant rodent toward extinction. Joseph Wartagesia remains the largest rodent ever known, even under the most conservative estimates of body mass. That single skull also reveals a far more complex animal than early stereotypes suggested tusk, like incisors capable of handling extreme forces, a bite comparable to large predators, and brain and sensory anatomy pointing to an active herbivore adapted to South American wetlands. Yet crucial questions remain unresolved. Its exact weight, posture, and daily behavior can only be approximated. What this teaches us is clear one fossil can reshape entire fields while still leaving margins of uncertainty. For more investigations that weigh bold headlines against research, consider liking and subscribing.